kickstart with our very first session that is on the Gambia tourism industry, the way forward. And it will look into detail on the diversification of the tourism industry with a greater focus on how to make it more resilient, sustainable, and productive. So I now have the distinct pleasure of handing over to the moderator for this very session, Mr. Haruna Drame. Put your hands together for him and all of our speakers. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am very excited to be here and um, even more excited to be moderating this first session that we are having for TAFCON 5 here at this very prestigious hall. TAFCON has been a phenomenal conference and meeting point for professionals from around the world. And indeed, it's been a pleasure for me to be a part of it. In particular, the startups that I have for the second year in a row uh, being a judge in, and I believe it's contributing immensely towards youth development in the Gambia. This session, which I'm very happy to moderate, and I have four professionals who know the sector a lot more than I do, so I will try to not uh, make myself vulnerable by exposing my not so wide knowledge of tourism in the Gambia. I do know, uh, when we met earlier in our briefings this morning, that I've been told for the last tourist season, we have received well over 200,000 tourists in the Gambia, which I thought was a phenomenal growth. But this growth has been challenged by the pullout of one of the biggest operators to the Gambia in the name of Thomas Cook. And these ladies and gentlemen here will advise, guide, and share experience and expertise with us as far as tourism is concerned and how we get to diversify the product for the greater good of the country. And first, I will start with the lady that's uh, next to me, uh, Ms. Pane. But then I, I am told it's ladies first, but in fact, when we sat in our briefing this morning, the ladies said they don't mind gentlemen first. <laughs> so, therefore, I will introduce my first panelist today, who is no stranger to me, whom I've known from the 90s at Radio 1 FM, when Mr. Late George Christensen was our boss, and when he pioneered FM radio in the Gambia. Mr. Adam Abba is the first speaker. We are giving every one of the panelists 10 to a maximum of 15 minutes, and each of them will have a maximum of 15 minutes. When we come back, we'll do 45 minutes of Q&A, so anybody with questions or contributions can contribute at that point. Mr. Anamaba founded the International Center for Responsible Tourism West Africa. It was established as a network of tourism professionals and regional training center in West Africa to help in the training of significant number of Gambian and West Africans on issues of responsible tourism. For five years, from 2005, Adama was a travel founders project manager for the Gambia. Adama co-founded the Institute of Travel and Tourism of the Gambia, and since it was founded in 2008, has been the chairman on the board of directors. In November 2004, Adam Abba won an international award as the person who made the greatest contribution to responsible tourism at the prestigious Responsible Tourism Award Ceremony at World Travel Market in London. In July of last year, Leeds Beckett University awarded an honorary doctorate degree of its university to Adam Abba for dedicated much of his life to responsible tourism, both in his home country of the Gambia and internationally. Our first speaker today is Mr. Adama Ba. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aruna. Uh, I, I have been, all my life, I have been in the tourism industry. I mean, adult life, of course. Uh, I joined the industry in 1973. Uh, some of the young people may not have been born. Uh, and moved gradually. I left high school and I chose to be a waiter. 
I started as a waiter and gradually I moved to be one of the managers. And, uh, but what I, I did all the time was to make sure I studied the subject. Because without studying, without having knowledge of the subject, uh, there is no way. It's like developing skills, it's like developing any other uh, uh, profession that you want to do. You must have a knowledge of the subject. I did my master's in my 50s, uh, when many people will think uh, you are old enough, you cannot go to university at that stage. Uh, but what is key in what we are discussing today is the issue of resilience of tourism in the Gambia and diversification. The two things, to solve our, res to, to, to be more resilient, we need to diversify the product. And for the benefit of the young ones and, and those who are coming from abroad to attend this uh, 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 occasion, the Gambia started in 1965, let me just remind you, it's tourism industry. And in 1972 to 75, we needed people to come, experts to come and tell us how we can develop it better. It was really small when it started. So we had some experts who came and gave us some advice. And one of the advices was, let's demarcate, let's actually get the whole area from Bacau Point to Katong and call it the tourism development area. That means our main product is what? Is the beach, nothing else. So for many years, we walked around sun, sand, and beach. That is the product we have. And we also built all our infrastructure around the sun, the sand, the beach, and winter sun holidays. And what that does is, you have tourists coming only when they have winter. And the other months we don't have, the tour operators will choose to take them to a sort of destination, like the, like, like, uh, the Canary Islands, which is maybe, or Spain, which, is, which has sun to and has beaches, and it's only three hours. Why should I put fuel, go all the way to Gambia, six hours, when I can actually do it in three hours? So they have shifted uh, to destinations that actually can give them more profit, uh, and then the Gambia is left doing a six months thing. Now, apart from that, what happened in the Gambia in the 80s was we started, we, we had tourism at the same time when we had our independence, you remember? So the government was not well experienced in tourism development and hence these experts came to give us advice. But then this country, because it was a poor country and the colonialists actually took all the wealth and we, we were left with nothing, the government of the day started to borrow a lot of money. And in the 80s, if you can remember, we came into serious problems because the debt was not manageable. And therefore, in 1985, what happened? We had the Economic Recovery Program called the ERP. The intention was to recover, but the underlying thing that they did not tell us was to recover their debts, because we have borrowed too much and we cannot pay. So what happened? They decided to uh, float our dollars. They decided to, uh, uh, the workers, most workers, the GPMB, if you can remember, was biggest government employer, and they retrenched a lot of the workers uh, cut down on the civil service, and there was a divestiture program. I'm so my friend, uh, Bax Abdullah Toure, is around, because they were the ones at NIB during those days, and they were doing that work of the divestiture program. But what that made was the Gambia was becoming more and more, because then we stopped subsidizing the farmers. We used to subsidize the farmers so that they can uh, uh, grow more peanuts. We used to give them fertilizers and all the rest of it so that actually more peanuts and other things can be grown. But the IMF came up with this program where we should stop subsidies. And therefore, the country became more and more dependent on tourism. And the thing is, 
I, I argue that tourism, if you are not in control, is not sustainable. We have a tourism that is controlled by tour operators. Now, anything that happens to those tour operators, like the Thomas Cook problem, then we suffer. It's not under our control. Now, if you have a situation where most of the industry is actually controlled from a foreign angle, which used to be the case then, then of course, little stays in this country. And that's why uh, we are very, we were, and we are now trying to get out of it, but we were very, very vulnerable because we are totally dependent on few tour operators. Now, apart from the debt, in 1995, you all remember the coup in 1994 that brought in Yaya 1995, what did we have? We had the British and the Scandinavian travel advice. And the travel advice was, because the Gambia was moving to an undemocratic system, we had a military push, therefore, all the British tour, uh, tour operators were asked not to come to the Gambia. By then, the British and the Scandinavians were the biggest operators. Of course, the Scandinavians were the biggest because they started the industry, then followed by the British. With the British travel advice, the whole industry, in, and it happened in November, when hotels have just bought all the things they needed, they've just opened, People who were sitting for six months just came in to work, and we had a closer. All the tourists went back. And we didn't learn from that one. Again in 2013, Ebola came. Even though we had no case of Ebola, what happened? No tourists came. Again, of course, 2019, we are talking about Thomas Cook. If we do not learn from this one, I don't know when we will learn. The point is, what we need to do, because we have all the challenges, we have poor destination recognition, attractiveness of the destination, we've been using the same products all the time. These products need to be rejuvenated. It's like any industry. Uh, we have a dwindling product quality. And we have an undiversified product because we are over-reliant on big tourism. And then we have the problem of air access. Most of the air, uh, uh, planes that come to the country are chartered by tour operators. The other scheduled flights, we're doing well now because now we have uh, uh, other, other airlines coming. But it was a terrible situation because a lot of the travel in the country was controlled by the tour operators. And added to that, we are not keeping our environment well. Yeah? Tourists are now complaining of dirty beaches, which, which, which was not the case before. We're cutting down the trees. We're doing a lot. And tourism goes with the environment. If the environment is not there nowadays, you cannot actually diversify, because people are talking about more ecotourism, which is more looking at the environment and looking at culture. But if we cut all our trees, and we don't utilize our environment well, and we don't give credit to all those things that, 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 that comes with the environment, then, of course, we have a problem. We're beginning to have problem on our beaches, yeah? Because many years ago, we did not take care of the environment. There was sand mining just here at Bigelow. And what that caused, what that created, is the sea was coming nearer and nearer until we decided to push it. We're just pushing the problem. Now we push the sand mining to around Katong area. It will come. So we're having serious coastal problems. Now the beach, which is our product, we are destroying. And of course, therefore, we have serious erosion. And this is what is actually increasing our vulnerability in tourism. But we also have opportunities. We all know that tourism comes with opportunities. It employs a lot of people. But the basic problem we have is we are not linking tourism with our local uh, uh, economy. We should have, because if tourists come, they want to experience something local. They want to eat the local food, just like Ida is doing. 
Bravo to Ida Chab. <laughs> they want to eat the local food. They want to see, eat, drink, experience local. But if you say for tourism is bringing a lot of foreign exchange, and then we use that foreign exchange to buy everything from outside, where are we going? And this also is a big problem uh, that we have. But as I said, there is a big opportunity now because now we are talking about a new Gambia, a new political reality. I hope that the authorities, uh, the ministers are gone. Uh, yeah, anyway, Ahmad should have been here because he, 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 he eh? yes, he's last eight. <laughs> because the new reality is if we miss this opportunity now, I don't know when we will have it again. And I said, many years ago, I was fortunate to be in New York when the United Nations was for the first time discussing sustainability in tourism. And I was given the chance to address the, 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 the whole thing from an NGO angle. And it was made clear there that sustainable tourism is the way out for our countries. We must not only rely on big tourism. We are not saying that we should do away with it because our whole infrastructure is built around big tourism. But as well as big tourism, we should develop others so that the, 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 the interest of people coming to this country is not for, only for the winter. If we develop it, and develop up country tourism, our river. We hardly use our river, which is sad. Because cruise tourism is one of the most developing type of tourism, tourism happening. And what happened to Thomas Cook is, is that. Thomas Cook refused to change. They were dealing with mass tourism all the time. They were actually using the high streets to sell their, their, their packages. When companies like TUI and others were using online booking quickly, fast, and Thomas Cook had a lot of staff on the high streets selling their holidays. But this increased, and people now, they book their holidays through their, their phones. And therefore, uh, Thomas Cook refused uh, uh, to change early. We need to change very fast our tourism industry and look at diversifying our products so that we can actually bring in more tourists. There can be more choices for people to come and visit. And therefore, we'll not only look at one uh, 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 winter uh, minutes, uh, period Bob. for people to come. Lastly, I'll just give you the story of the, uh, of the uh, how you call it, uh, the bad top. Uh, there was this friend who went to uh, a mental hospital and uh, asked the psychiatric doctor, uh, how do you know that these uh, uh, mental people, when they are okay, how do you know? He said, we put water in the bathtub, a lot of water in the bathtub to the brink, and then we give them a spoon, we give them a bucket and a basin, and we ask them how they can actually empty the bathtub. And he said to the guy, if it were you, how would you empty the bathtub? He said, obviously, I would just take the bucket. The bucket is bigger, so I'll empty the bathtub. I said, no. You actually just unplug the thing from down and all the water goes down. <laughs> so this guy, who I'm sure so was a Gambian, is just traditionally, he uses the bucket, so the bucket is a quicker way. Not actually moving to look at technology how it is walking very fast in the wall, and therefore is left behind. I hope the Gambia does not stay behind that way. <laughs> and to finish, the guy told him, which room do you want? I, I was the going one to, with the window or that one? That. Because you should also <laughs> stay here. <laughs> in, in fact, I, I don't know if my mic is working, but that's what I was going to say, <laughs> that the, that Gambian body bunker should have been admitted. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mr. Adam Abba. The, the years of expertise and experience is actually shown in your brilliant presentation. 
Now the first lady, who apparently refused to go first, and is now going second, um, Umi Sise, is going to be our second speaker today. Umi earned a bachelor's degree in business administration in 2005, and uh, followed by a master's degree in 2007 on tourism management from the University of Surrey, UK, a leading university in tourism studies. She undertook her master's thesis on sustainable tourism in the Gambia and transmits this knowledge through her passion for engaging in development activities that not only focus on economic growth, but are socially empowering as well. She has volunteered time in tourism education, where she lectured at the leading institutions in the Gambia and continues to engage in mentorship activities with girls especially. You see the bias. Umi joined Discovery Tours in 2006, a sole proprietorship ground handling operator established in 1993. Discovery Tours is the first ground tour operator owned by a Gambian woman and is still one of the very few that is managed by a woman in a predominantly male industry. Umi is responsible for overseeing the general management of Discovery Tours and has been influential in the growth of the company. She's passionate about the activities that fosters the progression of the Gambia tourism industry and seeks to contribute towards sustainable development through the inclusion of responsible initiatives in the company's operations. In addition to numerous, in addition to numerous engagements in networks and interest groups, she also sits on the board of the Gambia Chamber of Commerce and Industry, GCCI, and was nominated and approved to be a member of the high-level, newly formed National Business Council, representing the women, youth, and tourism sectors. Umi Sise, the floor is yours. Thank you, Harun. Yeah, I'd just like to start by congratulating Mr. Mustafa Njai and his team on successfully organizing a fifth TAFCON and also on the celebration of um, TAF Africa Global's 30th anniversary. This is something that, you know, as a Gambian, I'm really proud of. And we hope, like Imam Babali um, mentioned in his prayers, that Allah will give us more sons of the Gambia, like Mr. Nye. So thank you very much for your service. <laughs> I am one of those that have compared the Gambia with destinations like Cape Verde. But I think it's about time we stopped the comparisons. And I would start with myself and focus on what the Gambia can do to transform itself. itself. Because Cape Verde is more of a mass destination, like Ms. Tabba mentioned. We do have mass tourism, but it's about time that we shifted the focus and attracted a different kind of market in order to, you know, shift away from this stagnant position that we have been in for quite a while. Um, the Gambia is a small country, but with big potential. And I think um, we don't need to start formulating new policies and strategies in order to move forward. We can start by actually operationalizing the policies that we have. And I always say that we only need small gradual steps in order to have a progressive shift into a more productive um, destination. And in order to have this progressive shift, I think we'd need to start with a complete reorganization as a nation. We wouldn't just need to focus on what um, we, you know, what actions we need to take in order to transform the destination Gambia, but rather how do we implement reforms that would actually filter down and influence the tourism sector. Because as a nation, I think there's a lot that we need to you know, clean up in order to move forward. So in terms of um, competitiveness, first we need to reevaluate who our um, real competitors are, because I think that has changed over the decades. So once we reevaluate and establish who the real competitors are, um, how, I mean, what competitive advantages they have on us, then we can start by better positioning ourselves in the global market. And in my opinion, I think the basis for comparison 
of competitiveness usually revolves around um, accessibility of the destination, um, value for money, infrastructure, environmental friendliness. I mean, as well as now, this is very important, um, the returns to the community where these tourism activities take place. So it's quite a broad topic, so I'd just like to perhaps focus on a few perspectives today, um, and that would be on policy formulation, branding, and also catching on with um, global trends in the tourism market. So tourism's contribution to, I mean, the Gambia's GDP is significant, but we can do a lot to change this and improve it. First of all, I'd just like to comment the government and authorities on declaring the Gambia a visa-free zone for travelers from the Baltic states, from the EU, the Commonwealth, and Africa. This would really help in increasing our numbers. 200,000 is significant, but I think we can do quite a lot better. <laughs> yes, and in the recent collapse of Thomas Cook as well, the authorities did a great job in, in waiving landing fees for airlines and tour operators as well. This was also another group initiative but I think there are a lot more um, challenging logistics for airlines and tour operators arriving in the Gambia. There are a myriad of taxes that I can't, whenever I try to list them, I tend to forget. Perhaps Mr. Haider would help us, you know, <laughs> list those later. And also the cost of aviation fuel as well. Believe it or not, there are some airlines and tour operators that would hop over in another destination just to refuel before coming into the Gambia or when leaving. And that shows you how, significant, um, how significantly exp more expensive the Gambia is compared to other destinations. So if we are looking at competing with these destinations, why are airlines going there? Why are operators preferring to send more people there? We need to you know, evaluate all of these issues in order to move forward. Um, it must also be emphasized that timeliness is, you know, essential, and I think in the Gambia, this, that's one of her biggest challenges as well. Um, a couple of years ago, when Egypt had the crisis, we managed to increase our tourism numbers, but that was not because we had made improvements on our product or the destination. It's because there was a crisis in Egypt, which resulted in a lot of tourists flying over to the Gambia. So God forbid any, you know, issues or, you know, unpleasant situations happen in other destinations. But when that happens, we have to take advantage. Thomas Cook, Thomas Cook's collapse has happened. What have we done? Were we timely enough in trying to attract new operators, in trying to also change our product a little bit? We can never remove ourselves from the mass tourism I mean, industry, but we can try to focus on higher yielding um, tourists that come to the Gambia. And that takes us to branding. What are we trying to showcase? We have the culture, we have the beaches. The beaches used to be our number one selling point and the weather and the culture, but that needs to change now. Um, I call Mr. Mustafa Ngai Papa because over a decade ago, we shared a vision and passion to bring Nigerian tourists to the Gambia, you know, to get our African brothers and sisters to come and enjoy our warm country. And I think it's that passion that has also transcended in you know, him making Nigeria his second home and expanding the business to South Africa Global. So I, we at Discovery Tours, we represent um, top writers from Europe, and these are the regular type of tourists coming in. But at the same vein, I am very much passionate about um, developing and expanding the market from the African region. Because it's not only based on assumptions, but based on the services and the, um, the business we've done with these operators from the African destinations. I know it's higher yielding. And I, a Nigerian, a well-to-do Nigerian, could afford to stay at the most expensive hotel in the Gambia, like Coco Ocean. But that same uh, well of Nigerian would be the same one that would venture to Tangi interact with the locals, take along a box of smoked fish, they would go to the restaurants, they would buy the most expensive bottles of beverages, they would go to Albert Market and buy the Ankara and wax fabrics. 
So these are tourists that would spend in all sectors of our economy, and that's what we need to encourage. Yeah. So now, with, in terms of branding as well, we need to be more consistent and prioritize our focus. At some point, um, all-inclusive was not allowed in the destination. Then we move to another period where it's allowed. <laughs> we get to a point where we want to entirely focus on the European and East European market. Then it's the African market. I mean, we can, if we script our branding and marketing formula in a very good way, we could really um, benefit more from all of these diverse markets. And that would only help in increasing our numbers and making a, a destination better. And we also need to address deficits in the availability and um, quality of the infrastructure in the Gambia as well. Um, it's basic standards, like I said in the beginning, that we need to start working on in order to realize big transformations. I'll tell you a short story. Last year, I traveled with um, my six-year-old and three-year-old. So my six-year-old had said to me before we came home, um, Mommy, I don't want to go back to Gambia. I just ignored him. So the morning of her flight, he said, Mommy, I told you I don't want to go back to Gambia. So I finally said, but why? He said, because I want to live in a nice and clean country. The Gambia is filthy. Yes, so I, I didn't know what to say. So my daughter, then three, three years old, was excited. No, Mommy, I want to go to Gambia. So on the flight, she turned around. She was three in her own you know, pronunciation. Mommy, are you excited? I am excited. We're going to Gambia. So my son said, no, no, Gambia's filthy. She said, you wait till see. So we got home. It was a dark, but my son made it a point to point out all of the disorganized you know, <laughs> stuff along the road from the airport to the house. So by the time we got to the house, the three-year-old was finally convinced, OK, I don't want to live in Gambia anymore. <laughs> We get home, <laughs> and I, I had to scream at them, at them to get into the house because they refused to get in. So I was proud because my six-year-old and three-year-old were having such an observant discussion. But at the same time, I was worried. It's such a bad sight on our main highway, Bertil Harding, to the coastal road. So if these young children can realize and observe this, what are we doing? And tourism comes with beautification. It comes with cleanliness. And you know, change and development comes at a price. If we continue this habit of extreme empathy, I think we're never going to get anywhere. We could start by setting a fine, just $50, for the peanut and fruit seller along Senegambia. Because this would be a significant amount from their depends of fish money. If you find them once, the next time, they'd make sure that the environment is clean. And where should we allow shacks set up on the road everywhere you go? We're talking about tourism. I am sure, and the fish seller selling shrimp along Bertil Harding, Harding Road. You're on a coach, the air conditioning is off, but it's so overwhelming, tourists in the bus can smell it. That is wrong. We could start, this is what I mean by the small basic steps. But in other countries, in the Bahamas, they don't necessarily have you know, luxury buildings everywhere. They have managed to maintain the colonial buildings. And this is what tourists go to see, because it's clean. Painted white, the streets are clean. And can you compare the number of visitors the Bahamas gets compared to, the, to Destination Gambit? So it's the basic steps that we need to start looking at. And some tourists would you know, blink twice, I'm sure, if they are in the coach driving from the airport to um, their hotels thinking, oh, are we in a car sales destination? Their cars you know, lined up everywhere. How about we clean up a dumping site or an isolated area, have all the cars parked there, and the government can benefit from you know, the parking fees and security. I mean, these are basic things that we really, really need to work on. And a lot of these things require minimum capital investment as well. So, um, you know, these reforms come also, we talk about this a lot at every gathering, a lot of attitudinal change as well. We need to change our perspective. We need to believe in what we have in order to, you know, transform that energy into the great product that tourists want to see here. So, 
Yeah, and also, like Mr. Ba was saying, I'll round up soon. <laughs> I don't know, you know, you're thinking. Um, he gave the example of Thomas Cook and TUI when using people around the streets to um, sell the tours and order is going digital as well. If we want to be competitive, we look, need to look at the world trends. We look, need to look at millennials. This is the biggest generation group right now, Gen Y. And I'd just like to share a few um, facts um, on the millennials and you know, just to justify why we need to focus on them. Because millennials would spend a little bit extra just to get to purchase a product from a company that supports a course. We have so many companies here that support a course. And basically, the main course is you create two a minutes. Product. Two yes. minutes. <laughs> so millennials also would buy a product based on recommendation from social media as well. Um, most millennials would book five holidays a year, and three of these holidays would be traveling abroad. They want to see culture, they want to experience food, they want to meet with people. And that is what we're strong in, that's our competitive advantage. So I think it's about time we invested in cheap marketing in terms of the money you dispose of, I mean, because social media is cheap. It wouldn't cost us a lot. So um, basically, I'd like to maybe stop here for now. For Aaron and Thank you very much. Let me thank you for creating such a beautiful picture of our beautiful country. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, I, all those flowers littering the streets, all those good lights that never go off, <laughs> all those amazing vehicles well, we on the need, highways. We, we need to actually accept what we are in order to move. So. That's why I made it. No, no, I, I agree. I mean, if we cannot have open and frank discussions, change will not come. I agree with you in total. The next speaker um, had a strong background in port operations and management, investment promotions and facilitation, tourism development and management, entrepreneurial leadership, business development and productivity, and is highly motivated to take challenges in international development, governance, and related fields. The next speaker is Abdullahi Hydera of the Gambia Tourism Board, who's got an MBA, who's got an MBA from the University of Brunei in Oxbridge, UK. Mr. Hydera, you're welcome to add your 15 minutes to how do we get to diversify, improve, develop and repackage our tourism product in a competitive market. Thank you um, very much, um, Arona. Um, I begin by joining the rest to congratulate Ms. Njai for organizing such an important and very impressive um, organizational skill to have such an important conference in this country, being the fifth year in a row. Um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, I think um, Ms. Arona is quite a broad uh, topic to discuss, but I just take cue from both Mr. Ba and Omi, and I've identified within the team that there is a gap. And the gap that exists is quite a big gap. And perhaps that tells us why we are still where we are. And what I want to say is, in the Gambia, what is lacking is strategic partnership. In this country, and I take cue from the very first assignment I had when I joined the Port Authority in 1998 by my late boss, by Ibrahim Jagana. May he rest in perfect peace. The first assignment he gave me was to identify who are the port stakeholders. I came up with the write-up and I had about 52 in my list. 
I went to his office and said, no, this is not even half. And I began to wonder where I should be heading to. What that taught me was that I needed to consult with people who were around before me to be able to identify where the stakeholders. I did that and we ended up with a list of about 103 stakeholders. And that was acceptable for him. When I moved to my next assignment at the Investment Promotions Agency at Gaipa, then we realized that in order for us to facilitate effectively and meaningfully investment, we need to identify also our stakeholders. And one of the key strategic direction that we took was to identify who Gaipa stakeholders were then we'll be able to forge partnerships and relationships. And the first we thought of was Gambia Chamber of Commerce. At the time, my brother, uh, Mr. Almame Funding Tal, was there. And we began to establish some very meaningful discussions and sign memorandum of understanding to be able to work together as a government institution and a private sector institution so we began thinking about public-private partnership, which is very key in our development agenda, but which I also think is really lacking in the Gambian industry. Tourism is one of the biggest sectors of the economy, contributing meaningfully to GDP. But if you look at tourism as a sector, the players in tourism, the role that government plays in tourism, I think is most of the time overboard. Tourism is everybody's business. But if I quote from Milton Friedman, he said the business of business is business. So that means government has no place in tourism as a business partner. All it should do is to create the enabling environment for the private sector to take it and move forward. What I'm trying to drive here is that our private sector players need to come together and identify amongst themselves how do we work together and forge a stronger partnership. And that will support the growth of tourism and will ensure that it forces government to come up with the right policies that will support the businesses. A guess in example, when we discuss the issues of high cost of electricity, the high cost of taxes, air accesses, government creates this enabling environment and also government comes to play a role in this. If we forge partnerships and we become very strong partners, our partnership will drive government to adopt the policies that will drive our businesses, rather than we allow government to set the policies and drive the agenda. We need to come together as people, as country, to identify how we can work together and bring in the businesses that are needed to develop the industry. As a country, there are various associations within the tourism industry. The hotels, for instance, the tour operators, grand tour operators, small scale enterprises. But what is lacking in all this association, if you look at the number of businesses that perhaps have been registered as um, small scale enterprises, like we just have some new startups, I can bet that 50 to 60% of these businesses have not registered to be a member of ASEAN. So we are operating as standalone individual businesses. Will our voices heard by government? Can the required support be for individual, or is it better to come into an association or partnership and send a request for support through the um, government policies? Today, we have about three different associations called, you have uh, travel and tourism associations, you have ground tour operator association A and B. Do we really need that? Why not we come together? And amongst ourselves, we can identify our individual partners. Both Mr. Ba 
and Omi had talked about the collapse of Thomas Cook. And what has the collapse of Thomas Cook thought of? They've mentioned them. That is dependency on tow operators. We have our own Gambian tow operators who have got license to be even a UK tow operator. How do we come together to actualize us owning the tow operator business owned by Gambian, driven by Gambians, and to be benefited by Gambians? What we do is we leave this in the hands of foreign players. And what does the foreign players do? They come form an association, come to Gambia, establish their businesses, take the cream of the tourism industry, take all the foreign exchange they had brought in back to their respective country. And we as a country, what do we get? Absolutely or almost nothing. Because we are not taking advantage of the opportunities that our country, our economies have provided to us. The Gambia is a signatory and a member of various international associations like the UNWTO and others. That's the government policy. But what is quite critical and very important is how do we bridge that gap? How do we come together as a country? Currently, there are needs in air access. Government has come up with a task force to establish an air access tax force to look at what is needed. The air access tax force, what they're doing, is basically not reinventing the wheel. This has been already established and created by the Tourism Development Master Plan. In the Tourism Development Master Plan, there are 13 technical reports. And one of the reports was the establishment of an air access. And in the establishment of an air access, the key is to establish a national career. Do we leave this in the hands of government to establish a national career, or should we come together as Gambian and register and establish a career owned by the private sector through joint venture agreement, either through a public-private partnership or a public-public privacy, or an, SB, an SPV? special purpose vehicle where we create an entity and eventually um, other private players may be interested and we buy shares and move on the industry. I think tourism as a sector should be in the hands more under the private sector than the government taking control of the tourism. All the, um, the issues that have been identified here are issues of very important in the drive of tourism. But what is happening is, in the past years, from the second, first republic to the second republic, and now on the third republic, we have allowed government to take the leadership, the, um, the leadership role in the drive of the tourism sector. We have key private sector players. But these private sector players are most of the time in an individual, individualistic way. And the only way we can be heard is when we come together as people, as private sector, and take the ownership of the industry. Government does not own the industry. Government should provide the enabling environment for private sector to take the leadership and administration of the tourism industry. And what does government do only becomes a regulator. Now, in the event of these things, and many years in, um, from uh, the First Republic to the Arab Republic, we have not been able to do. And most of the time, when two engagements and discussion were said, in quote, dictatorship. We are now three years into full democratic dispensation. What are we still doing? Are we still leaving the businesses of tourism into the hands of government? Or should we come together and forge partnerships and agreements to develop the tourism sector? I think days are the gone when we begin and continue to blame in the past dictatorship regimes for what has happened to this country. It's the history books have written that. 
we now move forward. How do we move forward? How do we move forward? Tourism as a sector, the way forward. What is the way forward? Do we have to remain stagnant, allowing government to develop the policies, develop the strategies, and run the industry? Or should we just government come and do a, either written or policy pronunciations, and we come together as private sector and take the industry and move it forward? I think this is the way forward. And, um, and to start with, we as Gambians should begin to own our industry. We as Gambians should be able to identify how we can build our synergies and bridge the gap. Because the gap is very wide. But with the support of government policies, we need not sit for government to pronounce an incentive package. We dictate what level of support should government give to us. The only way we can do that is when we come together. And we can only come together when we begin to think and rethink what kind of strategic partner we forge as people, as a country, as a private sector. The, uh, I think the most used buzzword in the private sector are the engine of economic growth. But in the Gambia, I'm not, that's not what's happening. Government still controls, government still regulates, government still dictates to the private sector the do's and the don'ts. I don't bore you with long statements on this matter, because it's an open secret. The way forward is for the private sector to take the ownership, and we begin to form strategic partnership as the way forward in the tourism development in this country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hydra. Uh, I don't know what to say as a private sector operator myself. I, uh, I think you've been bold and you've been uh, throwing a lot of shade in our direction. So when we come to the Q&A, we will see how we level up to the task. But I like your level of boldness because this is what development is about, that we can talk openly and uh, no bars. The next speaker has a bachelor's degree in management, postgraduate degree in finance and master's in international business administration, has an understanding of the integral role of entrepreneurship to foster development. And uh, Ms. Pane has a second postgraduate degree in entrepreneurship and spent one year studying French as a professional language. While studying, she worked at Hunter Tech, an Indian-based company, as business development officer while running her own foundation, Citizens United Switzerland to support integration, human rights, skills development, and employment for migrants. She also served as coordinator for the African Center Against Torture, an NGO based in Switzerland, to advocate for the prevention of torture and the rights of tortured victims. In September 2018, Ms. Pane joined the International Trade Center as national tourism consultant, where she worked Cent her work centers on supporting tourism development through product diversification, capacity development for SMEs, skills, implementation of support programs to foster growth and sustainability. Ms. Pane is currently serving as an advisor for tourism and additionally creative industries under the International Trade Center. The next speaker is Ngone Pane. Thank you very much, Haruna. Um, and I would like to thank the TAF management for organizing this event, but also giving us the opportunity um, to discuss on the tourism and the way forward and how do we make the Gambian tourism more competitive. I was here during the last TAF conference and it was inspiring and I learned so much. So when I was invited to be a panelist, I was super excited. And that was before I found out who my fellow panelists are. 
these amazing people, my mentor, my lecturer, and the director general of the Gambia Tourism Board, so no pressure. <laughs> Tourism in the Gambia is, um, has proven to be resilient over the years. The previous speakers has mentioned um, all the challenges it has gone through, including the 1994 coup, the 2017 elections, the Ebola outbreak, and lately, the Thomas Cook bankruptcy. But through all these trials and tribulations, it has managed to get back on its feet and keep going. So Gambian tourism's problem is not resilient. It has enough of that, I would say. What it faces in terms of growth is more on its ability to compete with other destinations. Do we ask ourselves why is it that we are closer to Europe than many other destinations, yet they receive more tourist arrivals than us? We are cheaper, yet they receive more tourist arrivals than us. We have the same product and service offerings, and the challenges in terms of tourist numbers and economic benefit remains the same. It all boils down to competitiveness of the sector. The sector has challenges in to compete because of various reasons that we will not be able to name all today, but the very basic and the most notable ones start from the identity on diversified tourism offer. What is our value proposition? What are we selling as a destination? The sun, the sun, and the sea. This is what we have studied in school, and it is still what is going on. To diversify, there is need to move from this product offering to community-based, maybe to more on ecotourism, using creative industries to create new products, festivals, we have a rich and, and proliferate culture in the Gambia that we are really not capitalizing on. We have so much resources in terms of nature, but what are we doing to develop products around these areas so we are able to boost our value proposition? On diversified source market is another challenge that is restricting the Gambia's ability to compete internationally or even regionally. We depend so much on the European market we have potential to attract the Americans, yet they are not here. We have potential to attract markets from other continents, yet they are not here. All we see are tourists from Europe or the Scandinavian countries. So there is need to diversify and try to attract new markets. But that cannot be done if the products that attract them are not developed to support their demand. Tourism is essentially an experience industry. As it progresses, it needs to grow and need to continue innovating to meet customer demands and needs. And if we are not focusing on developing new products or depending on technology to sensationalize our products and services to attract new markets, we will not be getting them anytime soon in the Gambia. Access to air access, lack of innovation, access to finance, even low capacity of SMEs is also affecting us greatly. And this is more so on the experience of what the tourist feels or experience while they are within the destination itself. While tourists are here, their first point of contact include the ground handlers, the tour operators, category B I'm, I'm referring to, the official tourist guide, horse riders, craft sellers, even the fruit sellers. But how much capacity do these people have to be able to deliver products and services to the satisfaction of the tourists? What are we doing as a country to support and build their capacity? What are we doing to support them as small businesses or SMEs? These are the gaps that we tend to leave behind, but they tend to have a greater impact than we realize. Because once I go to a destination, I don't have a good experience, why would I go back? We are aware that the Gambia have a lot of repeat tourists, but they're here for other reasons, like hospitality, the people they know, and because it's mass tourism. When do we get to attract people with more disposable income so they can spend, so the impacts can trickle down to the local masses, 
from the person that is selling juice to the person that is producing farm products to the person that is in the village in CRR or URR. When do, when do those people get to benefit in terms of tourism? I would also want to highlight in the mismatch in the labor market, that is the capacity of Tibet institutions. Are they producing the right educated individuals to match the market demand in terms of labor? Service provision become a challenge because there's a mismatch in the market already. The labor survey that was done identified a number of areas in terms of the labor market that are missing within the tourism sector. And these are things that we cannot do away with. So I would really emphasize on the need to build the capacity of Tibet institutions. When we cannot do this, if we don't find out what are the market gaps are, and this will include us going down on the ground, collecting data and doing an assessment to know where the capacity gaps are in order for us to be able to supplement or support. In these areas, the institutions need to be supported to build their capacity in terms of the courses they offer, development of curriculums, but also supporting people that are not able to afford courses to be able to attend these programs. So at the end of the day, the demand of the labor market is met in terms of workers. Now, low impact along the value, selected value chains. I come back to my point of connecting other sectors like agriculture to tourism. ICT, information communication technology, to tourism. Creative industries, to tourism. These are three big sectors that can support growth within the tourism industry. Either in terms of producing the food that we consume in the hotels. To do that, farmers up country or anywhere else needs to be supported. Build their capacities, give them equipment, give them skills. We know the hotels have standards, so why don't we support them to develop their products and service offering to these standards so what they produce are able to be sold in hotels? Why are we not using the creative industries to create to support creative tourism, creating new products. We know there's development in terms of festivals, but there is still a lot of gap that needs to be done. The branding of the destination, using creative technology, using smart apps, to sensationalize, digitize our own services and products that we have. So potential tourists are able to come before they even arrive in the destination, they are able to picked on what they need to see, what they want to experience, what they want to feel, what they want to eat, where they want to go. So we are able to better represent our country as a tourism destination. Developing new products and services, nature-based, ecotourism, or creative tourism, or community-based tourism, to diversify away from the dependency on mass tourism and mass to operators. It will enable broader investment, maintenance, and innovation. Because we need to now move away from focusing on the coastal area and go down to rural Gambia, where you really have authentic and unique product offerings. These are the people that when we talk about culture, that are able to give you an authentic experience. Because it's them that form the basis of culture and tradition. And we have so much of that. So focusing on building their capacity and developing community-based tourism, or using the river, like Mr. Bo was saying, using the river to build tourism along the River Gambia, these are all offerings that are able to support growth, foster job creation, export, and develop our image. Languages. We are English-speaking country, yes. But the tourists that are coming here, some of them are from Germany, or Portugal, Spain, or Scandinavia. What are we doing to reinforce training in language areas? So when the tourists arrive, we are better able to translate our products and services. Before they come here, the websites that we are using to market the Gambia or the platform, it should be able to translate into so many other languages. So we are better able to target more tourists out there rather than focusing on the English part of it. 
So courses in languages, but also focus in terms of diversifying our marketing techniques. Integrated policy. I was mentioning about working within the creative industry and agriculture and ICT and the tourism. To do it, there is need to focus on an integrated policy that is able to link actors, resources, and support cross-sectoral collaborations. Then the SMEs within the tourism sector, these are the people that have been doing so well. Whenever the sector fall into any trials or tribulations, it comes back to life. But it didn't come back to life by itself. It's we are the people, the dedicated businessmen and women, the sector associations, the communities, the juice sellers, the craft market sellers, the tourist taxi drivers, the public agencies. These are the people that come back together and keep it going. What are we doing to support in terms of their capacity building? Do they have access to finance? Do they have trainings that can support their growth? Have we ever done an assessment to see where their capacity gaps are so we are able to better structure and deliver structured support to support growth, but also employment creation? If we depend so much on tourism to create employment, but also to contribute our GDP, then there is need to focus on capacity development of SMEs within the sector. Regionally, there is Regionally, there is the African free trade. There is need to organize a regional market based on complementary rather than competition. The Nigerian market, for example, is growing bigger than any of the destinations within West Africa, tourism-wise. Why don't we start it as a powerhouse of West Africa, where each other country can add to its services, or its tourist offerings, rather than we compete within each other. If the African free trade had made it possible, so there is need to capitalize. There is also need to evolve competition into cooperation. We are so close to Senegal. We share a lot of history, either the slavery or culture. Pro promoting like regional routes, either from Senegal, Gambia, Senegal to Ghana, or Ghana, Senegal, Gambia, or any other destination within would be able to support growth regionally in terms of tourism. And then we are better able to diversify our market and also attract people within the region of West Africa or Africa as a whole. Thank you. Ms. Ngone Pane, I, uh, absolutely there was no need. There was absolutely no need to tell you you have two minutes to go because you have... Uh, graciously giving me two extra minutes. Um, my, uh, my panelists have done quite well. Uh, I am uh, of a different breed. I, I, I think uh, they've tackled their topics with diplomacy and tact. That may be given as it may be, but we know there's a fourth S in our tourism sector that we are ignoring as Gambians and we are not identifying. And I'll put it out there that the image of the country has been tainted because there's a belief that all the tourists come for our younger people, either to marry them or to have other relationships with them. And that has stained the image of the country. Now, if we are going to diversify the product that is tourism, that is uh, putting off a certain section, a certain community from wanting to come to Gambia because they would not want to be labeled as such. Now, as a branding and communications person, I, I think firstly what we need to do is to look at that image and see how we can rebrand ourselves. Then we talk about the product and varying the product and the service and what we are going to do. For me, this is one key area. I know we have 45 minutes, but I need to provoke a discussion so that when the microphone gets around, people will ask relevant questions as well. Again, I recently observed Ghana, and I have been seriously dismayed that the year of return is making such huge impact in Ghana. What happened to the Gambian Roots Homecoming Festival? 
What happened to it? What are we doing as Gambians and as a community? The culture of mediocrity that we have in Gambia and we keep nurturing is what we need to stay away from. You cannot create a standard, yet you deliver below your own bar. We need to be consistent, we need to be qualitative, and we need to be adamant about that quality and keep driving higher each year. But you cannot create a symbolic product like the Roots Homecoming Festival and have it sliding every year, every year. And it's not even happening anymore. So that's why I said when Mr. Hydera was pointing to the private sector that we need to clap back to the public sector to say, yes, we as private sector participants, we are making the efforts, but what is the public sector doing? What is the government doing? There have been several years when the, the American uh, were targeted, especially the black American community, they used to come in their numbers. So was the Caribbean, they used to come in their numbers. So was the British community, they have a connection, a bond with us. A friend of mine recently went to China and they were, this was a tourism discussion and the person said there was a Ghanaian representative of tourism in China claiming Kunta Kinte, hello, <laughs> from Ghana. How can Kunta Kinte be Ghanaian? There's a Kinte in Ghana? But this is what is happening. If you're not respecting what you have, what you own, who you are, others will embrace it, develop it, and use it against you. Our neighbors, Senegal, have been smarter than us in almost every industry, and the tourism sector is no exception. They brand roots, Senegalese. We have our Jufre in Gambia. Now, a lot of tourists go to Senegal for Kunta Kinte and roots. So they spend two weeks in Senegal, one week in Senegal, and you know what? They spend six hours in Gambia. Through our border, go to Jufre, back again to Senegal. Or go to Kafunting and other areas of the Casamans, and then go back to Dakar. These are the issues we need to talk about. If we're not talking about them, the change will not come. So for me, if we are going to advocate for change and development, we must be honest about our realities. We must create our objectives, we must make them clear and loud enough, and we must pull everyone along that chain. Now, the tourism product in the Gambia, from the early 1980s when I worked at my auntie's batik factory in Latikunda, we do the tie and dye. It's the same tie and dye product in 2020. The elephants that we are giving in our craft markets is the same. I can give those elephants a name because they are the same. The total we do is the same. The Kajikali we do is the same. The Katam Falonko we do is the same. Now, if a tourist from Senegambia Hotel wants to go to Jufure, it takes you a whole day. How is that? Why is that? These are the issues we need to tackle as Gambians. Why are we not using the River Gambia? I don't see why somebody cannot go to Denton Bridge, go on a boat, and then go to Basse in 45 minutes, one hour, and come back. Our roads are horrible. They're bad. Congestion is everywhere. The river is here. Why are we not using it for locals and for tourists? Ladies and gentlemen, this is my contribution. I'll open the floor now for questions and answers. You can direct your questions to any of the panelists by name. Thank you very much. My name is Fatou Dege. I'm not a tourist person, but I'm just listening to what you have been saying. I will direct them to Haidara and uh, Harunad Rame himself, and then the whole panel. I mean, we are hearing a lot of problems. This is a problem, this, but I've not heard anyone say, we can do this in order to change what is there or what was there. And uh, according to Mr. Haidara, he has, um, he has highlighted the importance of coming together. And I think everybody in this room would be glad or pleased to, to know that there is something going on. My question is, is there any initiative that is being taken by any one of the tourist persons here to come up together? And 
all the issues that have been highlighted, what are you going to do? Because I expected someone to come up and say, okay, if we do X, Y, Z, then we'll be able to achieve ABC. And uh, one of them is Ms. Fane, he, she has come up with few ideas, but then the coming up together for me is very, very important as a nation. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Fatu. Um, uh, yes, I think for and on behalf of a government, uh, and this is very recently, uh, the co collapse of Thomas Cook, government set up an, an, a group of people called a task force to advise government on the best way forward. And I know I don't want to preempt the consultant's report because we are finalizing it, but the recommendations of the consultant is to set up a national airline. And in that national airline, government will have to take minimum, minimum, and I must repeat, minimum shares, and the rest of the shares will go to the private sector. There are other two potential Gambian private sector owners who are interested to come on board but it will be open. So any other private sector who is interested to come on board, it will be better, because government should take the minimum, minimum shares for it to work and to function as a business. You know what would happen if government have shares? They will not pay for the tickets, they will be the families and everybody will be traveling for free, but if the private sector own it, they will run it as a business venture. This is what we want to encourage, so that the Gambia, for at least once, have its national career. Thank you. I just have a short recommendation. I know Haider very well. And um, just listening to Haider, um, I'm thinking, is GT board part of a government? Is it a parastatal or not? Because I believe it's within the government system as well. We're talking about public-private partnerships, and we're talking about national level, regional, and continental. There's the AFCFTA negotiations that is ongoing, and most of the economists within the continent are actively negotiating. The negotiators at that panel, at that platform, is mostly government officials. I hate to compare Gambia and Senegal, however, what the Senegal, Senegalese private sector is doing, they hear about this ongoing negotiations, they don't wait for the government to come to them and say, we have signed this agreement on your behalf because you are the implementers. They would summon the ministers of trade, the chambers of, Senate, um, of commerce in, in, in Dakar would say to the government, you are negotiating on our behalf. We are the implementing agencies. We have to be part of these negotiations. So you identify pioneers from the private sector, from the tourism board, from um, um, the, the Gambia to, um, Umis, Umis company. And these, these um, experts would join the government officials to negotiate. At the moment, they negotiate in trading goods. The next phase of the negotiations is going to include trading services. We need private sector representation in these negotiations, because Gambia is not an island. We're talking about competition and competitiveness. However, we cannot be competitive if we are isolating ourselves and having a, a discussion at the, at the national level. This has to be taken into Thank you, Anta. Uh, you want to react to that? Or Mr. Khan, please. Mr. Then Abdullahi we get to Hadere, um, yes. you are my Toma. So you kind of opened up a can here. So. <laughs> But I think um, our weakest link in this country and why we're not moving forward, unfortunately, is the government, okay? You're talking about partnerships, but many people here in the diaspora or even in the private sector are investing locally with zero support from the government, myself included. Over the past 18 months, I've spent over half a million dollars of my own funds contributing to this nation with zero support from you guys, zero. My friend here, Ismaila, from Charlotte, North Carolina, opened up the nicest pharmacy and healthcare clinic. You know how many visitors he's gotten from the health board at his facility? Zero. Tough Khan, fifth year. How much funds have you received support from the government to help you with this? Zero. How many government officials are sitting here? So, we are ready to move this country forward. The question is, is the government ready to support us? And it, right now, the answer is no. Thank you, thank you, Malik. We'll go to Al Mami, but that's why, that is why it's very important to have had the Minister of Tourism here with us, stay through this session, and also have officials from the Ministry of Tourism. Whether they are here or not, I don't know, but someone needs to hear this so they can deliver on it. Mr. Tal. 
Uh, Haidara, you want to react to that, or we go to Almami, then come back to you? I, I, I can react to, uh, okay. to this. Um, your, your point is, is well noted, but I, what I know for sure is that government has established what we call an investment arm in government called Gambia Investment and Export Promotions Agency. This is an agency that should take responsibility of all foreign direct investment and domestic direct investment in the country. And there is a support at the level of GAIPA that government should give. Perhaps maybe you did not visit GAIPA, but if you have not, I would want to encourage you to visit the Gambia Investment Export Promotion Agency because by the time we left GAIPA in 2015, the GAIPA New Act has a provision for what we call Gambianization. And in the Gambianization of the investment code, there is a lot of support that could be get from government through GAIPA. I want to encourage you to visit GAIPA to see if that is still in place because I left that uh, GAIPA five years ago. But as far as I know, there is some level of support that should come from government to the private sector. Mr. Tal, Almami. <clears throat> All right. Um, thank you very much. Um, nowadays, I find it necessary before making any public comments to start with a disclaimer, because whether I like it or not, everybody believes that I am UDP. <laughs> and uh, I just want to start by paying Thank you tribute. for using my platform to promote your party. <laughs> no, I was, I, was, I was going to say that all the comments I want to make here today um, does not bind the UDP, it's not from the UDP. I am talking as a Gambian, coming to my brother uh, Mustafa Njai's uh, wonderful event and to congratulate him as uh, one of the leading Gambians who provide this uh, platform for us to network, to discuss uh, important uh, matters uh, affecting our country. Also, I would like to pay tribute uh, to Okodrame and the recognition that uh, Taf has also given him. Yeah. To, to recognize also the presence of uh, someone like Alpha Bari, who has also been working behind the scenes as a good uh, financial advisor to a lot of Gambians and a lot of Gambian businesses. I, I thought if you start by recognizing uh, the good in others, it's not very difficult to say the right things. Um, the right thing is for us to change our concept of what is government all about. We need to reinvent government. Because a lot of us don't understand that governments, either in Japan or in America or in Singapore, they do all their business because you and I, the private sector, and the citizens pay them taxes. So government cannot do anything for you. It is for you to insist on having a capable state that can deliver on a value chain basis the development aspirations that you have. And I think our tourism industry in the Gambia uh, for a very long time has not been looked at as a value chain. But that value chain itself exists within an ecosystem. I'm very proud and very pleased that uh, Mr. Ba has tried to speak about the larger economy. This ecosystem that we call the Gambian economy, it needs certain enablers and it needs certain triggers. And the first trigger is to have uh, a legal system that enables uh, online payment that enables uh, booking your uh, tourism uh, stay in the Gambia online with security. So our starting point, somebody suggested that we should have solutions or offers. Uh, I think Umi mentioned this. If you go around Senegambia, you cannot believe this. This is the hottest spot for tourism in the Gambia. I mean, my brother Ablai is here. But to clean that place alone will not take more than $100 a day. The place is so dirty. The Senegambia Strip, the buildings are so uninspiring. 
it's very easy to pedestrianize that whole area. Just make sure that no vehicle goes there. If you want to park anywhere, you park away from there. So you walk to your, your destination. You see nice side cafes. Sometimes I wonder whether people in tourism in the Gambia have ever been tourists anywhere in the world. Because this is the other thing. Because if you, if you don't know how to entertain people, I mean, you, are no, you have no business being in, in, uh, in the entertainment business. If you have never been entertained, for example, in Bali, or in uh, Mauritius, or in Singapore, you will not know how to welcome tourists. Last point. It is not the business of government to be in business. This cliche has been exploded by Singapore, by Mauritius. Uh, of course, China has shown everybody that government can also do business as long as it is doing business. So my brother Abdullah, government needs to invest in tourism through public-private partnership. If that is done, if you go to Senegambia, you have only the village as the nice spot where our uh, distinguished diaspora comes even to relax. The other point is that, what, 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 uh, the last point that uh, my brother made about Mr. integrating, uh, Mr. Ba uh, made, is about integrating the whole economy into tourism. So that when you come to Gambia, you really have the experience of uh, being in Gambia. Let us reinvent government. Let us give it a better task of how to use our dialysis and our bututs so that the development of this country... Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tal. Who, who is the timekeeper here? I, I am a bit lost. Aziz Wulan, you have your two minutes. Thank you very much, Ron. Once again, it's a big one. Welcome to an order, TAFCON. What I realized this year is a full house. That's why I sent him a picture that is an order level into 2020 and beyond. We Gambians, if we don't believe in our souls, it will never work. That's the reality on the ground. If the Gambia tourism sector, the government, doesn't respect the center of creativity into production, it will never work. The manager for Yusundur, Mr. Madi Drabe, is here. I should have been with TFM since the inception, but I believed in home, that's why I stayed home. <laughs> Checking the calendar of events for December this year, on the 27th, on the 28th, and on the 29th, I'm not saying that it shouldn't happen. The borders are open. But uh, the Wali Seca, 27, 28, and 29th, a day after, on the 31st, and on the 1st was Vivian, a day after was Titi, and uh, three, four days after is Yusundur, where is Gambia. I think uh, it's time for us to revisit. It's time for us to rectify and revamp. And the only way we can do that is to believe that the more we share, the more we grow. I had Mustafa Njai be interviewed by Peter Gomez in one of the programs called uh, The Gambia We Want. He is the only Gambian who believes that the more we share, the more we grow. I just have people complimenting Mustaf out there. If there was 10 Mustafa Njai in the Gambia, it's an order level of its own. <laughs> Oko is being recognized. How many years? We are not part of the system. We are not being engaged. We are not being interviewed. And I think right now we should get a festival inviting the experts in the creativity industry, not in get Carnival. The St. Louis Jazz Festival, these are things working. But at the end of the day, the Gambia, I'm not saying about Roots Festival. Roots has been stained. 
It was all about Futan path, uh, the initiation process, manhood passage. It was even from Dufure, where the other end of the borders are willing to even mention names. Uh, I'll mention Kanilai, okay. Thank you. <laughs> I've got the facial discussion with the DG of Gambia Tourism Board. We've worked a lot at the Gambia Ports Authority as a consultant <laughs> for their OPEX program. We are proposing a program called the Gambia Festival, ours, taking ownership. We imported so many foreign uh, artists, and if you double check the contracts for all those artists, the peak of the tourist season, Christmas again, we, could, we are not patronizing Gambians. The open mic festival was like, but look at the other end when we balance the scale. Still, we, are, we don't believe in ourselves. Gambia Tourism Board, I think it's time to open doors. We got to revisit. We got to rectify. We got to revamp. A good example is this. 2020, I think we should take it to another level. Thank you. We should take it to another level. There is a lady there. Uh, yes, the Ibadu. Let's do the Ibadu. We'll do the gentleman here, and then we'll close with the two ladies. I'm told I have 10 minutes. Yes, her. I'm told I have 10 minutes. Please make it short. Because I'd like to give one of each of the panelists at least three minutes to wrap up. So let's really do this quick. Okay, I'll try my best to do that. Good afternoon to all of you. Okay, I have a comment first. Um, the problem here is one thing all of us can agree to is you tell an average Gambian, can you pick that up? They wouldn't do it because you say, this is Gambia, nowhere else. When they go to Europe, they'll find a bin, they'll go and throw the stuff in there. But then you put a bin right next to their foot, but nobody will take that same trash they were holding on their hand and put it in the bin. Why? See, that is a problem. And I can say that inside this room, right, we have more than 10 people who might be doing that right now. So when we get away from this place, right, for our own health, for our environment, how do you make that change to make sure that the future generation, your children will grow up and say, I want to go to Gambia again? Not just for the tourists, but for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arona. Um, Mabuso Cham from Senegal. I have just three points I would like to raise very quickly. The first one is tourism in Senegal is not as beautiful as I heard it. Um, because same mistake, both in the Senegal and the Gambia, it's this kind of double country we would like to have. A nice country for the tourists, and another one which is not very nice for the Senegalese and the Gambian. It's impossible. When you talk about traffic jams, when you talk about fruits, about vegetables, if it's good for the Gambian, it will be good for the tourists. So let's not split the country into two parts. That's the first point. Second point, I wish to know if our countries are serious when we talk about development in tourism. I bought my ticket in Air Senegal to come here. 170 CFA. 30 CFA for the company, 140 taxes between Senegal and the Gambia. I mean, let's be serious. That will never work. Arona, you don't remember, but I was here one week ago. Yes, you came to my TV. You yes, had a chat, I remember. With, with the Felwin. I'm not that um, old, you know. It took me six hours to cross the ferry last Sunday. No way. Last thing. You don't have example of countries which have developed tourism without first-class airline companies. Yep. There's no a single example in the world. Now, when you discuss with professionals, they will all tell you the same thing. If you want to have a good company, the absolute minimum standard of passengers you must have per year is two millions. That's for the break-even. Now, total traffic at the, airport, at the Dakar airport is 1.6 million. In other words, there is no way Senegal can build a sustainable airline company. 
What about the Gambia? Uh, we, we get 200,000 tourists a year. No, I think we have to be serious on these issues. If we want to develop tourism, agriculture, industry, in other words, if we want to develop economic integration, right, we have to build things which are sustainable among ourselves. But if Gambia want to have its own business, Senegal is own business, and Cote d'Ivoire is own business, it will never work. It will never work. Let us recognize Mambuso Cham. So we'll give you, uh, Mambuso, we'll give you one minute, and then we'll go to the other ladies there, then we'll give each of the panelists three minutes to wrap up, then we'll call it a day. Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Abi Sar. I was a stalwart of the uh, tourism industry. I won an award in Nigeria as one of 100 women in tourism in uh, Africa in 2017. Um, you know, in Gambia, we have all that it takes. We have all the ingredients. We have all those infrastructure. We have the history. We do not need to reinvent the wheel. It's not hard work. Now, look at how Ghana has gained in this year of return, everybody went. They had huge numbers, they had stars, they had big names. Nigeria, two days ago, just launched door of return. Now we don't need to launch anything. We have Jufuri. Kunta Kinte is home. Go there now, you don't see anything. You don't see anything. What we need to do is recreate the Kunta Kinte village, it doesn't take too much imagination. Go and put in some structures. We use people like um, uh, Aisha Fofana. Yep. To put in structures that are authentic, that will bring emotional tourism, that will stir the emotions of the people. And the American embassy is poised to support in this area. And we need to just do a few things, um, tweak a few areas, and it would work. And we really need to rethink everything. We Thank are you. not serious. Thank you. Tourism today and tourism three years ago, it's like a 20-year difference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to Mama Sar there. There, yes, 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 yes. Um, my, I wanted to talk about um, some of these issues being discussed here. But already um, my sister has mentioned about implementation. I think Gambia government, we have the, the most beautiful reports. We have the most talented writers. But the problem is translating those reports, tr translating those projects into actual implementation. That is our problem. And we need to work to get that done. I think especially in the tourism industry, there has to be a government policy to bring tax breaks for youth entrepreneurs that want to invest in the tourism industry. We have to fight for our youth. We have youth startups here coming up who do not have single tax breaks from government. That is, um, anywhere you go in the world, mm -hmm. in, in, in any country, and this is, you see youth startups being given the opportunity to grow through tax breaks, through, um, uh, um, um, you know, mentorship programs, etc. And it's, uh, we have to commend Mr. Njai for starting this in Gambia because we did not even have this. So thank you for your vision and for, for really, you know, encouraging our youth to, to understand that, you know, uh, they are a part of development. We need to encourage this. And I would ask everybody in this room, even if we need to create a, a task, a, a group with, which will pressure the government, we need to have tax breaks for our youths. We need to have tax breaks for our youth. Mr. Adam Abba, three minutes. It could be in response to some of the questions, could be a statement, could be an opinion. Thank you. I think the questions were really good and uh, what following up. I don't know what this conference is going to do in terms of following up things so that uh, there is some advocacy to make things work. But what I hate most is Gambians competing with Senegal. I mean, I hear it all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm a Pan-Africanist. I mean, if Senegal is doing something better than we are doing, let's go and learn from them. I mean, I, this thing about Fatala, why should we go to Fatala? Why don't we have it here? You know how much it will cost to breed lions? Abuko tried it. Yeah, and the land you need to have elephants to roam around, 
What land do we have to have wild animals everywhere? If Senegal is doing something that our tourists can go and visit and we will make money from it, let's use it. The tourists pay dollars, they pay in pounds, they pay in foreign exchange. So we are not losing anything. What are we losing? Apart from our dead fairy that they talked about, which we need to do something about, it's even become risky. Some tour operators are saying that tourists will not go overside. But Fatala is a good product. If we can find it in Senegal, we go for it. If we can find it in Ghana, we go for it. And the longer it is, the more tourists will pay us. And it stays in this country. I'm just from Senegal. And the Senegalese said to me, I, I, I have done work for their exams pro promotion. They didn't look at me as a Gambian and say, because you're a Gambian, I've been doing work for them for three years at the world travel market to promote some of their products. They can utilize me as a Gambian. I mean, if we have something to do there that is tourism related, let's go for it. And let's stop this, why can't we do it in Gambia? Why can't we, you know? Senegal is doing many things that is far away than what we are doing. And if we cannot cooperate with our next door neighbors and go and learn from them, this air access, we are part of the committee, and we are suggesting that we should go to Senegal and learn from them. If they do it wrongly, why should we do it? If they are not able to do it, we go to Ghana, find out. If Ghana is doing it and it's not sustainable, why should we do it? I mean, this is the way we should learn from each other. And then, those things that are good, we take. If they are bad, we put it aside. I mean, I think if in tourism, this is the way we should be doing things. And the further it is, the more Umi's Crown Operation Company has money. Because you charge about 90, 90 pounds, I think, to go to Fatala. No, 70. 70 pounds to go to Fatala. OK? And you go and pay, then what is left is in the country. So I think we should actually learn to also learn from others. If they are doing good things, we go and, 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 and learn from them. Thank you. Uh, if they are doing good things, we go and learn from them. Umi is next with the three minutes, but I, I'm going to say it. no more questions, Mr. President. I, I'm sorry, you are in Equatorial Guinea like Yaya Jame. He had a good point. You don't want to go to Equatorial Guinea? No. Let's so you give him your minute from your three minutes, huh? I just wanted to confirm to Mr. Bar that Fatala initially came to Gambia. They were frustrated by the government of the Gambia. That's why they went and strategically located themselves 20 minutes from the border. 90% of their customers are tourists from the Gambia. Thank you. Exactly. And only three minutes. Yes. Um, I'm glad the issue, I mean, the event in Ghana was brought up because I was going to talk about it, but I missed it. Um, we're losing a lot on the slave trail. And like Mr. Bass said, a lot of the um, revenue we get is from combined trips from the Gambia and Senegal. And if we were to benefit from the slave trail, Gambia, Senegal, Ghana, again, back to reorganization, how can we organize such a big event like Ghana D if there's a broken down jetty in Jufuri that's been derelict for three years and it hasn't been fixed? Again, back to organization. And when you ask, oh yes, there's a program, there's funds to fix the jetties, but what is being done? Kunta Kinte Island, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. There is funding for rehabilitation of such projects. Why aren't we sourcing it? What's the point of having a draft proposal sitting, getting, gathering dust on a you know, government desk if we're not making use of this? Senegal. Benin, Mauritania, Cote d'Ivoire, they're benefiting from the West African um, coastal areas management program. And we are losing our beaches, which is one of our greatest assets. But it has to, I mean, I very much advocate for creating better synergies between um, the sectors. But there are roles that government need to play. Now, um, I also wanted to mention this. We cannot, like I said before, and Mama also said, 
we cannot, we don't have to need, we don't have to start creating policies, but we just need to operationalize the policies that we already have. We cannot allow certain actions to happen, you know, in oblivion to their sensitivity to other sectors. Look at the fish meal and, you know, toxic waste being deposited in our waters. That is going to affect our health and eventually tourism as well. And, um, you know, we're sitting here talking about the dirt. We're not just sitting here making blatant statements. We do try to fix these things as well. I and my mother personally, we've been to a high government office to try to get this cleaned up before the tourist season. Nothing's being done. You call the Brikama area canceled. I mean, they come collecting dues, but what, what do they do? Again, and to DJ as well, I think we do have to collaborate more. But, you know, unless government and the authorities are open to more inclusiveness with stakeholders. This is not going to work. And um, yes, we have to work together, but the different sectors in the industry we need to be well regimented. You cannot have the fruit seller, the juice presser, in the same association with a ground tour operator. The objectives are just not in line for us to all say, you know, question the reason for these different segments. <laughs> so, really, we all have to take up our different responsibilities, work together, but still, there needs to be better monitoring of the different sectors if we are going to hold somebody, um move the destination forward. Thank you, Umi. Mr. DG, three minutes, closing statements. Thank you very much, um, Arona. Um, I think um, for us here, we are not by any means trying to represent the entire central government. We are here by virtue of being the Director General of the Gambia Tourism Board, which happens to be a government institution. But I'll also be very happy to let you know that the Gambia Tourism Board shares your concerns. We are sometimes equally frustrated by the serious concerns that are coming to us that most of the time we need a third party to fix it. Um, what is happening right now within the tourism industry um, is a concern to all of us. And I will start by the cleansing issues. This has aggravated in the last two to three years because there is a complete additional um, attitudinal change with us as Gambians. Before we can enforce, when you, before you get to the beach on Sundays, you have to have people to check on you by way of enforcement. That's no longer the case. Now people have a very free care attitude. Nobody cares about where they dump or where they throw rubbish, walk around the, the, the TDA. The Gambia Tourism Board, which is not a government subvented institution, may I have to repeat that, we do not get money from government. Everything that we do, we create revenue streams to support our activities. We have a 25-man workforce that is paid for through the Gambia Tourism Board payroll. These people, all those people you see cleaning from traffic lights all the way to turntable, are staffs of the Gambia Tourism Board. Where are the municipalities? It is not the responsibility of the Gambia Tourism Board to ensure that the beaches, the roadsides, the dump sites are clean. But we take up the responsibility. But now it's time for everybody to take tourism as their business. The municipalities need to play their role. Gambia Tourism Board needs to play their role and government needs to enforce. Without enforcement, we are nowhere. There is no way that the regulations are set if they are not going to be enforced. We have to accept to enforce the laws so that we respect each other. Um, time is not on our side. But moving forward in 2020, Gambia Tourism Board have made a paradigm shift. Last year, with the ministry, we've organized a tourism stakeholders conference. This year, check on the dates, 
we will be organizing a tourism product development initiative conference where we will invite all the key stakeholders in tourism to support the Gambia Tourism Board to think how do we move the product suite forward so that we become an all-inclusive decision made by the tourism stakeholders and the Gambian people themselves. Thank you very much and watch out for the day. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Ngone Pane, ITC, yep. My conclusions will be based or drawn from what I've been hearing from the public. Um, a lot of the challenges are infrastructure, implementation, and of course, um, business development support or investment. So if we are to move forward, there would be need to work on developing uh, what is already existing in the country. This starts with um, road access. If we cannot use Jufre, it's because Jufre has no road access, or even if you use the river, the jetty doesn't work. And so goes when you want to cross the ferry to go to the North Bank side. The ferry takes hours to go, which impedes on the effectiveness of the operators or other service providers. So goes to our attraction sites. All the sites that we are calling as attractive in the Gambia that are bringing tourists here have the same challenge. Maintenance, innovation, presentation, communication. How do we upkeep them and promote them better and present them better? These are all implementation activities, operationalizing what we already have or developing them that works need to be done. The government doesn't have to do it by itself. There are, the youths are ready. There are, are Gambians that are here that are ready to invest. Duna agencies or international organizations, in particular where I work, the ITC is ready and here to help. All we need is an open door, an inclusive approach and collaboration between the public and the private sector to push development forward. We have been working with the GTB and even the National Center for Arts and Culture and a lot of other private institutions or sector associations to support capacity building and development and developing new products either in the creative tourism sector or um, community-based tourism of country CRR or promoting um, festivals within the Gambia. So while we are trying to push forward development, there is need for us to redirect our focus on being inclusive in either the policies that we develop, but also um, our objective in terms of um, operationalizing the existing infrastructure, products, and services. So I will just um, reiterate to continue to encourage everyone to take ownership of what we are doing and to focus our energy, our resources, and our services into developing what's already here. Thank you. Well, I, I didn't even have to stand up. It was two minutes, 20 seconds. I'd like to thank you for being an excellent audience. I'd like to take this challenge and throw it out there. Each of us can make a difference in this industry. We call the Gambia the Smiling Coast for a reason. But beyond the smile, we can be excellent. We can be good. We should be able to advocate for high quality, high standards, improvement on those standards, maintain our standards. I think that's one of the issues in this country. We do not believe in quality. When we have quality, we don't know how to maintain it. Excellence doesn't come by accident. You work at it. You keep working at it. This is the challenge for all of us here. And I want to thank my panelists on this discussion. It has been hot. Mr. Adam Abba, thank you very much for honoring the invitation and being here. Ms. Umi Sise, thank you very much for being here. Mr. Abdullahi Haidara, Mrs. Umi Sise Sala. Is that appropriate? <laughs> and Mr. Haidara, thank you very much for being here. Ms. Gone Pane, thank you very much. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here with us. Thank you so much to our amazing speakers. It is fact that the tourism sector remains the second highest earner of foreign revenue. Therefore, it is of utmost urgency that we solve all of these challenges that continue to affect this sector. So I hope that the discussions that have been 
tackled very well, as well as the solutions that have been generated from the various speakers, as well as the audience, have been translated into actions and implemented effectively. So thank you so much to our speakers, and you may feel free to take your leave. Thank you so much, and give them a round of applause. Um, I'll now like to invite Mr. Lamin Job, uh, a very creative and brilliant young man who did a portrait of Mr. Mustafa Anjai, Uncle Taf. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Mr. Lamin Job. <laughs> I hope so. Where do we stand there? Eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Can I see some few things? Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hey, you, you want to say something? Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. Greetings, everyone. Uh, first off, uh, I'm really honored and humbled to be standing in front of this very uh, honorable, dignified, and you know, respectable podium to present this portrait to Mr. Mustafa Njai. Uh, my name is Lamin Job. I am a final year political science student in the University of the Gambia but I specialize in artistic imagination and creativity. As a result, I have a registered business called El Jobis Designs. Um, I have a reputation of designing portraits of uh, hardworking and really inspirational Gambians, including Mr. Haidara. Uh, around, like, about a month ago, I presented a portrait, this kind of portrait to Mr. Abdullah Haidara. So uh, my aim is to develop and promote arts in the Gambia. So I'm coming up with an initiative. I'm organizing an art exhibition. Actually, it's taking place this month on the 21st of January at Alliance Franco. It's called Art Exhibition of Creativity. So uh, the, theme, the theme of the exhibition is climate change, but part of the sub-themes uh, regards uh, the tourist activity, actually, in the Gambia. So I would love each and every one of you to attend it and Support me in my endeavor. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. Thank you very much. Just a short statement. I mean, um, before we disperse. Thank you so much. We appreciate this. I mean, actually, that's a good entrepreneur. You know, you don't wait for the ball. You go for the ball. And uh, imagine he's brought in a top portrait, but he's got free marketing. <laughs> so good entrepreneur. Those are the signs of an entrepreneur. But anyway, I appreciate it. And thank you for making me look more handsome than I am. Yeah. Thank you. Now, on a final note, um, uh, I would also like to applaud um, uh, Yaos Konate. All the ladies' jackets that you saw were done locally by Yaos Konate. And um, the material also is sir. It was weaved locally, actually, in Senegal. And thanks, Kati, for all the struggle to get it here. And uh, the gents were done by um, Usman Mendy. This is, um, uh, this is Malik Mendy's son. This is local content. I think we need to recognize this, that you can look good you know, by promoting local content. Finally, there's a challenge that I want to appeal that we postpone till next year. There's a six-pack challenge that I got involved in. <laughs> and I, you see, I tried to put my tummy in. But I'm still struggling with the one pack. So um, I appeal that we let's postpone the six pack challenge till next. You are laughing. You are not part of it. Arona has even joined the one pack. I am impressed by this crowd. It's getting bigger by the day. It's, bigger, it's getting bigger by the year. So thank you very much and see you tomorrow morning. God bless. Thank you so much. There's lunch outside and also a special place set up for networking. So let's seize the opportunity to meet new people and build our network.